Hi, Seth. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. I should say, this is Stephen Yablo. Um, um, so, um, I never read that Ciardelli paper I, I cited. <laughs> that, that was, I mean, I, I just was trying to defend myself against the charge. Just, the way, just what you, you said, if I really do know that, uh, I mean, it's a funny sort of, it's a funny sort of transition. I say, you know, if, if P then Q, not Q, maybe having, sorry, uh, therefore not P, maybe if I now try to say the same thing again, I should put it in counterfactual terms. Maybe it was like a transitory, like indicative, <laughs> the indicative formatting was sort of available only before, you know, up till the time that I did the, the modus tollens. But that was, just, um, so I'm glad to hear about the Chiridelli is what I'm saying. But I had a, I had a just, this is just really a, a question for your, just help you, to, to, to give us a chance to hear more about how things might work. So does, um, is knowledge of like epistemic modals itself graded? I'm trying to think like, so offhand, and this might be wrong, you tell me, I'm right. thinking like, if I'm, if I'm inclined to accept if P then Q, then I think I'm inclined to accept if it might be that P, then it might be that Q. Um, um, uh, now, if the, if the um, if the might statements, then I'm wondering if we get if we get the, a similar problem to the one we started with because if, uh, uh, pending a story about sort of embedded epistemic modals uh, uh, because uh, there are well it, it, so far it seems like there, there might be no worlds even in the in distant reaches <laughs> where it might be that p if might is indeed tied to the elite worlds. <laughs> Uh, so I just was wondering if you had any thoughts about that. And yeah, that's definitely pending, uh, oh. as you said. So the uh, like the Chardelli paper is, is restricted to a language without uh, epistemic modals in the antecedent, and uh, actually a lot of papers these days people have the good sense to just do that <laughs> uh, because things are hard enough. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, there is this question what's I mean what what naively I mean, you might think okay um, what you need to do is shift to an epistemic state that accepts uh, it might be that P and maybe that's just a matter of s sticking with the state you're in if it leaves P the be if the if the best worlds leave P open and oh, and now the question is, well, what if it doesn't? Uh, what's the nearest? Do we have some notion of the nearest knowledge state to one that doesn't make it, doesn't accept my P to, the, to one that does? Um, yeah, that's a hard one, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's what, that's what we have to spell out, yeah. <laughs> No, no, I don't know. I, I don't have any bright ideas about it. I mean, it, this is, it would be good to be driven partly by examples, uh, maybe. Um, uh, and not, while while you can, while there are conditionals with might in the antecedent that sound okay, um, it's not it's, it's not quite as easy. So um, yeah, but sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. That's it's a tough one. I just wanted to hear the state of okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please read it for me. Hello, Seth. I'm Daniel Rothschild. Oh. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Um, so I was, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I, I guess I had two worries, but I want to talk about one of them. Um, or not a worry, just a sort of further question. Um, so, so you talked about factivity a bit, and th th this is what like always like kills me about these like um, purportedly non-factual things in in knowledge claims. Is you still get some kind of factivity stuff. So yeah, 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 yeah. And like, um, I mean, as far as I could see, you kind of just lost the factivity, at least it, for for all I, I was following, which might not have been everything. And then like, of course, like the knowledge state itself has to be true, but then you do this sort of Ramsey procedure on it, 
And then that's, and then the only effectivity we get is what is implied by the success of the Ramsey procedure. And I just thought, okay, that, which is fine. That all sounds good, except for when you have mites, it doesn't seem like it works like that. Like if I say, Steve, at least I, I'm sure, maybe this is what Sarah Moss says in some papers, or maybe someone else says it, but you know, if I say Steve thinks, you know, Sarkozy might um, win the next French election, and Steve just thinks that because he, you know, hasn't been following French politics at all. I mean, I, I, I haven't, so I, maybe it is true. But um, that um, that has the implication that for us, Sarkozy might win the next election. It's not assertable unless, like, we accept that possibility as well. So you get this. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you mean Steve thinks or Steve, Steve knows? Steve knows. Steve knows. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, but that is to assert that Steve knows something isn't just to assert something about the limitations of his body of knowledge, even, and, or even that he's explicitly considered this question. It's to kind of endorse his accepting that possibility. And usually, I think it's mostly to endorse it for us, too, except in sort of like special cases, like when we're hiding prizes and so on. Um, so, 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 so this was like, at least always my thought was that with might, there's a factivity implication that goes beyond just the test of the knowledge state. The test of the knowledge state would just say, is it compatible um, with the knowledge that Sarkozy wins the election? And maybe, has it been considered properly? And, and then you get a little factivity implication, but it's very weak. It doesn't require that we, the people who say it, or the, the speaker, take this to be a live possibility at all, or even think that Steve knows it for a good reason. So, so, so this is my view. So, so my kind of view was, with might, you get this quite strong factivity implication. And then I'm looking at indicative conditionals, and I'm thinking, well, something similar must happen. And if we take your um, weakening of indicative conditionals, you wouldn't get the antecedent being possible, but you'd still get the, the kind of the indicative conditionals being sort of shadow true in some sense without the antecedent being possible. And then you at least wouldn't be able to assert the two indicative conditionals under knowledge things that have um, conflicting consequence, but it's the same antecedent. So we don't get the factivity of like, you know, it's not like somehow we accept in our context the, um, the complement clause. I, and so that's just, I mean, it's not a like actual worry. It's just sort of like, okay, so is factivity working two different ways, like one for might and one for indicative conditionals? I mean, where like the, the sort of hypothesis I started with is factivity at least works in that there's some sense in which when you make a knowledge claim, the complement has to be acceptable in the context. But I take it the, the case where you believe the two incompatible conditionals suggests that that just can't be true. Is that coherent? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I was, I just wanted to double check. Were you saying that you think A knows that it might be the P, you know, presupposes it might be the P or, you know, factive, fact, like factivity just kind of carries over in the, what you might think of as the expected way? Yeah, well, well I guess I, I was thinking that because of the Mike case, so, so, so my thought was a little more, I was thinking because of the Mike case, if you just do, if you take your, you know, definition of might, and you just apply it to knowledge claims, you wouldn't get a strong enough presupposition. The way to close that gap is to assume, yeah, something like this strong factivity principle. But then if you, yeah, assume, yeah, like, you, know, if you, you assume that strong factivity principle. you'd write it in in like a, you know, as a presupposition or something. Yeah, something like, like that. Yeah. Yeah, 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 right. No, that, yeah, this is something I took out of my handout, which is that that can't work. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but then well, if there's just like, is something different going on with, do, do you think there's something different going on with mites and, and indicative conditionals then in that respect? Yeah, so I mean, right. Well, so one question is just um, about, which I kind of dodged, was one about what to say about whether A knows that it might be that P, whether it entails or presupposes it might be that P. So one question is just that. Okay. Yeah. You know, your intuitions are leaning yes, and I think mine have traditionally, but this has all gotten me questioning my, you know, <laughs> questioning things. So uh, okay, yeah. Uh, so that's one issue. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think I think you're right that um, whatever factivity is, I don't think it can be what I would have said it was if I wanted to, you know license factivity there for my, um, like I, that is to say, I don't, doesn't look like it's going to work to write it in, you know, to the lexical entry for knows that here's the kind of like thing you need to do or, you know, 
apply this, apply apply the complement to the context to higher up or whatever it is. Um, that's yeah. So so uh, yeah. In my previous handout, I had just said that it, it like I actually have trouble seeing any semantic account of pres presupposition getting this right. Um, but I might just be my limitations about thinking about semantic account. So, so sort of weirdly seems to me like potentially evidence for some more pragmatic story about the factivity of nose, which, you know, I've never been impressed by the ones that I've seen, but uh, I've been prompted to kind of re-examine them based on this kind of thing. What do you think? But you're right, that uh, there is this, that there, that is the, that is the pressure that these examples, I think, create. You know, um, if you if you think the data is right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So Thanks. the the next question is Professor Fine. No. Thank you. No. Okay. So other. Oh. Okay. Paul? Look, uh, actually, this is really a follow up from Steve's question. And uh, now, of course, if you look at, let's say, David Lewis's semantics for counterfactuals, where you have these spheres around the actual world, of course, there are spheres around every world. <laughs> um, so, and that's what you would need to look at once you have these embeddings, like the, the, the mites or what have you. Uh, um, but can, I'm just wondering, can, Okay, so um, uh, e even if there P isn't open, there might be a uh, a non-elite epistemic possibility in which it is open, but then that openness requires that that, that non-elite possibility itself has its own sphere, just to make sense of that. Uh, is that... Is that picture where every world has its own set of spheres incompatible with this idea? I wasn't sure whether you could appeal to that or not, given the, this idea of uh, updating and so on. But anyway, that, that was really the question, whether you, you could help yourself to, to this idea that every world would have its own set of spheres. Um, yeah, I was thinking, you know, you... Um, Why not? So yeah, I, I was thinking, um, right, if P isn't uh, one of the elite possibilities, um, but is some non-elite possibility, you would update your information state by just considering the subdomain of just the, the P possibilities, and then, re, re, then examining the ordering just over that restricted class and finding what's best relative to that. Um, so. Right. Yeah, so I don't know that that necessarily requires thinking of like a function from each world to its, its, its besties or something, uh, as much as just you take the domain and you, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm not. So, so maybe there isn't a problem there uh, yeah. in um, okay. think, yeah. thinking of things that way. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I still think there's a puzzle about, um, you know, if there are no P worlds that are elite, um, and we say, if it might be that P, then, you know, yeah. how do you sort of transition to a state? What's the sort of nearest state according to which there is a P world among the elites? Uh, that, oh, you mean, you mean just, just making sense of that? That notion is that what, is what you mean? Yeah, because I was thinking, you know, the only picture I have so far is that you update an information state in this sort of Ramsey, and we're thinking of like the the informational update as like totally factual, a condition on worlds. So right. that just lets you knock out a bunch of worlds. But if if instead the update is to, as it were, make sure your best worlds have among them a P world. Um, it, yeah. It's it's a more potent and therefore more problematic form of updating, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so maybe the problem is not a technical one, but just a sort of more informal one of making sense of what 
what this updating might might be in such a case. Um, yeah, it's, it's not it's not the straightforward idea of updating that we that we normally operate with, right? So, right. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, thank you. So now, Paul, you have a question. Hi, Seth. This is Paul. Hey, hey Greg. Good to see you. It was great. Um, I, I have a question about the um, mighty indicatives uh, principle. I I think I I want to resist. If I understood the move you're making, you're uh, giving up on mighty indicatives. But I I wonder if you, you're not giving up too too soon or too quickly on the on the strength of that principle because. Um, I find the context that we get in 15, 16, and, and 17 to sort of be slightly defective. So if really Steve knows that Holmes doesn't exist, I'd rather phrase 16 as Steve knows that if Holmes existed, he would not be one of us. Um, you know, in the same way in which, like, it, it, it feels there's this famous... Uh, O.J. Simpson sentence, you know, I didn't kill Miss Simpson, but if I did it, it was, I don't know what he said, it was not in, it was not in the bathroom <laughs> where <laughs> everyone felt that it was weird to say something like what he said. He should have said, you know, he should have used the counterfactual form. Um, and in fact, when you discuss the Shakespeare context in 14 and even in footnote 8, I have the impression that the sense in which we're talking of common ground is really not in terms of common knowledge, but more in terms of uh, acceptance. So we accept that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Um, and then uh, I, the question be, in, the, in the dialogue sort of makes us revise it. Um, so I. I'm no longer sure what the strength of that example is. If you, you see where I'm going, right? I, I find I see the appeal. I, I, I get the wind of the, of the, of the, of the bullet here. But I, I, I think it must. You know, I still want to yeah. cling to the, to the yeah. principle of mighty indicatives. Yeah. Yeah. Good. No, thanks for the pushback. I mean, it sounds just. You sound just like me talking to Ivano when I first, <laughs> read his paper. That's just, I just had the same kind of reaction as you. So, um, uh, and yeah, I agree that the data is not, you know, there's some subtlety to this. And, uh, you know, you raised a point similar to Steve's intuition about like the temptation for counterfactuality, you know, instead, maybe in certain cases. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I think, um, But I, you know, I think part of you know part of what drew me to this package of views is well, I I guess I do think in fourteen, um, it is accepted. Well, you know, you might think by um, common ground, you just do mean what's like accepted in the in the conversation, and it doesn't seem like a a's first comment is like withdrawn. Um, in, on the contrary, B says that. She agrees, and then A continues that they're sure of it. So, like, it still feels like th that's as in the common ground as it gets. And then I'm worried that if the if accepting the conditional means that the might um, that he might not have, then you know you get an epistemic contradiction accepted in context, which I definitely don't think is right. So that's part of you know where I'm coming from. Another example is that Ivano talks about is footnote eight there. He, he's, he, he's responding to Gillies, who was one of the few people kind of directly defending the, what I was calling mighty indicatives. And um, he talks about an example where, you know, a soccer team is about to play a match and they just have no chance, you know, in hell of winning this game. Um, but, you know, this one team that they're about to get demolished by is really their only, is their biggest 
competition. And if, 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 they, if they were to somehow win, they actually would have a chance. Um, but you know, as it is, they have no, no chance. So Venom thinks in that kind of case, um, you can say, if we, might, if, we, if we win this match, we might win the World Cup, but it's not gonna happen. So that's to say like, denying the epistemic possibility that um, um, we might win this World Cup or win this match. Um, nevertheless, affirming the indicative. Um, and then, um, you know, part of me too is, um, I, I sort of have intuitions, which is kind of comes back to Daniel, uh, Daniel's intuitions about, uh, so in these iffy knowledge cases, maybe I'll, let me share my handout again, uh, so I can like point to what I'm saying. Um, you know, uh, for instance, yeah, this marble case. Jane knows that if it's not under A, it's under B. In a case where you know that it's under A. Um, I find it weirder, and maybe this is, Daniel has this intuition too, like to say Jane knows that it might be under A. Uh, I, I'm, I'm surprisingly more comfortable with saying she knows that if it's not under A, it's under B, than I am with saying she knows it um, might be under, might not be under A. Uh, you know, when I know that it's under A. Um, I, I didn't kind of lean on that intuition in the talk, but because maybe that's a little subtle uh, mm. and not everybody has that intuition, but that, that was another kind of thing driving me a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think, um, you know, it would be good to say more about this and really decisively refute this, you know. Yeah, thanks. I, 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 mean, I mean, I will want to say one more thing, which is like, you might think, look, I think it's very, very, very ordinary, like for an indicative conditional to um, go with the antecedent being epistemically possible in conversation. And pragmatically, like you might think it's virtually always, or, you know, pragmatic considerations will almost always make the antecedent not just possibility in the thin sense I've been drawing out, but like the more robust sense. And so if, if, we can, if we can say more about why in general that can be expected, that might as well explain the intuition of um, mighty indicatives without necessarily, you know, vindicating it semantically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks. Yes. Stephen. Okay. Gideon, please, please. Would you come there? Hi, Seth. Uh, Gideon, Rose. Uh, it's been a long time. Nice to see you. Um, just on this very last point, on the soccer example, um, I get the claim that it's totally OK to say, um, if we win this game, we might win the World Cup, but that's not going to happen. Um, but suppose the game has already been played. It's just been played. We all saw it happen, and we lost. In that context, it sounds really weird to say, if we won that game, we might win the World Cup. <laughs> You know, in both cases, the antecedent is known, but it's much worse in the second case than in the, I'm sorry, the antecedent is known to be false. Um, so there's something about the security of the knowledge when it's knowledge of the future relative to the much more significant security of the knowledge when it's knowledge of the past. Does that Wait, sound right? Uh, maybe make sure I understood the case is one where the game is over and what happened? We lost. We lost, as expected. Right. Yeah. And your conditional is, if we won this match. We might win the World Cup. So I'm talking about now what's past. Yeah. If we won. Uh -huh. Yeah. And, and talking about what will be. OK. Right. So in both cases, um, we know at the time of utterance that the antecedent is false. In one case, we can get away with the might but in the other case, we definitely can't. Yeah, good. That's really, that's fun. Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, the bar, part of what this makes me wonder about is like just the limits of iffy knowledge and whether, what they are. Um, how crazy can your ifs be? And, you know, you still get to count as knowing. 
Um, you know, the, my, my daughter likes this uh, cookie monster song that goes, you know, if the moon was a cookie, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd be very happy or something like that. And, you know, it, it would be bizarre to talk about if you knowledge of if, you know, what do I know if the moon is a cookie? Um, so, yeah, uh, right, that, that's under the heading, I guess, of uh, what remains to be explored about the epistemology of uh, if you know knowledge. Yeah, um, I, uh, well, yeah, your, your, your point raises further questions, though, about when two conditionals, when you manipulate tense, are saying the same or different things. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I'd have to think a lot more about that. Oh, um, to the extent possible, I've tried to abstract from tense since stuff is you know, messy enough as it is. But uh, you're right that um, if the knowledge of the future is yet a further question and might, might come, we might come by it more or less easily depending on what we already know. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That's really interesting to think about. Good. I, I wanted to ask something else, but I don't want to. Others have follow ups or round twos. What I, what I really want to know is how sort of straight up epistemology 101 would have gone if we'd been focusing from the beginning on cases where factivity or entailment doesn't seem to work, right? So I say, um, John knows that we're, if we're not in this cafe, we're in the other. And my interlocutor says, you know, I know he believes it. I know he has reason to believe it. but." There's a difference between knowledge and justified belief. Is he even right? And if I can't come up with any sense in which he's right, then I haven't drawn a distinction in this context between knowledge and justified belief. But we're itching for some distinction between knowledge and justified belief. That's what factivity gives us in all of the other well-behaved contexts. What, we, what would we have said about the difference between knowledge and justified belief if we had had fully justified belief, if we had these kinds of examples in mind where we're not in a position to say that the complement is correct, to assert it on our own behalf, to make it something we're willing to stand behind? Yeah. Good question. So. Uh... Uh, well, there's, there's a couple things. So one is, uh, and this came out maybe a little in what Daniel was saying, but, you know, indirectly. So Bill knows that if we're not this cafe or one across the street, um, that can't be right if um, it's neither true that we're in this cafe nor true at, that we're at the one across the street. So it's not that the truth of the knowledge description implies nothing about yeah, yeah. what's factually the case. So that's one point. But you know, your deeper point is one about, uh, so we have to explain that by the way, like there's this kind of, almost looks like um, the construction uh, presupposes the material implication. Uh, um, but if what I've been saying is right, the material implication view can't be correct, so, but why would that be characterized in presupposition? We have to say more. Um, but, you know, you, your, your other question was just like, well, how do we think about correctness um, when it comes to what is the virtue uh, that Bill's uh, epistemic state is, is said to have um, in these cases? Um, what is it about grading knowledge? What is it about grading the possibilities like this that um, makes this knowledge rather than, say, belief, uh, or just why belief. Uh, yeah, um, I, I think that's the kind of question I'm wanting to inspire, if not answer, in the talk. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. I think that's like exactly the right next question. <laughs> but I, I, it doesn't, that doesn't shake my confidence that this is like a kind of knowledge, just yeah, but it does show that, yeah, epistemology 101. Um, yeah, because that's the most to get. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Now, Professor Yandu. Yeah, so this is a follow up to, to several things. So, 
I mean, I think we need to distinguish sort of the, the indicative um, subjunctive distinction or whatever you want to call it from the morphological distinction. I mean, because sometimes it may be true as, as, uh, as Paul says that there's pressure having, uh, you know, emphatically said Shakespeare wrote Hamlet to, to put, to say not, well, but if he didn't, did someone else to say, well, but if he hadn't, would someone else have? But there's, in that context, that subjunctive morphology is expressing an epistemic conditional. And one piece of evidence for that is, if it was really, first of all, it would be false if it was really a counterfactual conditional. Why would someone else have written Shakespeare? For, we don't think it was like for, a foregone conclusion that somebody would, yeah. He just got there first. There was a bunch of people like straining at the finish line to write Hamlet. Um, but also, if you think about some of the tests that people use, like it's not, it's not in a, one test is, you can counterfactually suppose that things aren't as they actually are, but you can't indicatively suppose that things aren't as they actually are. But it seems to me that um, it says, you know, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. Shakespeare is the author of Hamlet. But now I can say, but if the author of Hamlet didn't write Hamlet, did someone else? That, that, sounds, that would sound great if it was really a counterfactual conditional. I say, well, if, if, he, you know, if the author hadn't written Hamlet. But it sounds ridiculous in that context to say, all right, well, suppose the author of Hamlet didn't write Hamlet for arguments. That, that you can't, you know, that, that, that sounds really wrong. That makes me, to me anyway, that makes me think it's really an epistemic conditional. And to the extent that the, the controversy is about kinds of conditional as opposed to the ways in which conditionals are written, I mean, I'm, I'm stating this much too strongly, it's, it's, it's still, you still would have a counterexample to, uh, you know, you're, you'd still be right about, mighty indicatives might still be rejectable if it's understood as sort of, le in less m morphological terms, even if you did feel for, you know, if, if, if you understood it more in terms of, you know, uh, c conditionals, you know, reflecting conditional probabilities or something like that or information states. I don't know, that's just a thought. Yeah, no, point taken, 100%, it seems totally right. Okay, so our last question will be from Louis. Hi, Hi. I'm, I'm Louis Rouillet, nice to meet you. Um, yeah, right, so I was, actually I was uh, very interested in your, um, the, like the, your last point, right? which is basically that um, the antecedent is impossible, therefore you, you don't know what to do with it. And uh, actually, I, I think the argument was, uh, was uh, there's the same argument is in uh, Gareth Evans at the end of uh, Variety's Reference when he argues against Lewis's account of, of, uh, of fiction. And it's actually exactly w what you say, meaning that, you know, uh, say Holmes, has to directly refer uh, according to Evans, and then there's no possible world in which uh, Holmes could pick an individual, right? And Lewis's account of fiction is just like, you know, go to the next possible world in which Holmes does the same things he does, and then, you know, it follows. But th so he's, so Evans makes the same argument, and, and he's, he, he goes on pursuing, so what do you think of this? But he thinks it's a good reason to embrace free logic um, in a way, which is that, you know, so the semantic contribution of uh, Holmes um, um, has to be that it, it doesn't refer. Uh, and then he goes for free logic, and I don't know how much you pursued this line, but, uh, but uh, it struck me that Evans made the same argument, but I don't know if you, if you, if you want to go that direction. Good. Yeah. So uh, let me think. Um, well, I was thinking that uh, folks like um, Stallocker or, and I guess Steve would be okay with saying that name is empty, uh, and um, that might or might not lead to free logic. I guess depending on well, what is if we mean like we're drop 
One question is like whether we're dropping existential generalization or something. Yeah. But there's a way to sort of keep that, but still recognize empty names, which is, I think, the kind of thing people like Snowmaker want to do. Um, but, you know, even if you do that, there remains this issue if you, because this is, that's one way of trying to stay million um, and just say, yeah, when names refer, they directly refer and otherwise they don't. And uh, there's a way to at least make the negative existential sentence true. But yeah, Steve's concern is um, there's still an issue of cognitive significance that arises. Um, we need the truth conditions of one and two on the handout, you know, intuitively to sort of come apart or something about the meaning has to come apart. And uh, maybe the meanings, um, you know, um, Maybe this feature of the empty names uh, doesn't emerge when we consider sort of metaphys meta uh, counterfactual possibilities, uh, counterfactual linguistic um, contexts, but um, it emerges in epistemic contexts or in iffy knowledge kinds of contexts. And then, you know, yeah, we have to tell a theory of, we have to give a theory of that. Um, and it's, you've got to go somehow beyond the million view there. Um, so, um, I agree with Steve that, uh, as he says, let's see, um, Steve should have the last word here anyway. So let me see, uh, at the very end of the handout where, you know, he says this bit. Um, I think, you know, um, is the, you know, one question is like, is the expected contribution of Holmes or Vulcan, you know, in these iffy knowledge descriptions, is it gonna, should we expect it to be like non-semantic as it might be, you know, pragmatic or, you know, Stallnocker is alive to this issue of um, cognitive significance and his account is pragmatic and involves diagonalization, but it's not directed at embedded contexts and it's never really been that clear how you're supposed to diagonalize when it comes to stuff that's embedded. And so, you know, that, that's, that maybe bears on the question of whether um, the issue is a semantic one. And so I guess, I guess I have the hunch that it is that ultimately your semantics of names is going to have to become more flexible um, and the million has to evolve or perish, you know, in the face of these kinds of uh, constructions. No, but I get, yeah. so I guess the next point um, is, is, is that you should distinguish between uh, like fictional names and, uh, and empty names, which are not fictional, like Holmes and, and Vulcan. Uh -huh. And so their semantic contributions would, would depend on the kind of empty names they are. And that's what free logic would open you to, oh, to oh, distinguish oh, between kind of the two it. and say like, you know, you know fictional, fictional names have a semantic contribution because they originate in fiction in some sense. And then, and then we have these texts, you know, to, to, to know what to do with them. Whereas like in case of non-fictional non empty names, get things, the story will be different, but you treat them completely, you know, equally. So I don't know. Yeah, mm. I guess that was the point, but. Maybe it's orthogonal, yeah. Yeah, I think that would come up in connection with like the semantics of things like according to the fiction. Uh, yeah. And like how that interacts with the names that it embeds. Um, but I mean, I like Steve's point that, you know, you might start out thinking it's a fictional name, but then still raise a question like, well, wait, if home exists, then I'm, all, I'm totally wrong. It's, it's not just it's a story and so blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we still have to account for that. And that's kind of pulling Holmes, the name out of the fiction or out of the, you know, the, the subject no longer takes it to be true that it's fictional. Maybe the speaker that neither, do, you know, doesn't either. Uh, but we still have to account for the meaning of that whole construction. Uh, oh, this is fair enough. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. So now we may thank our speaker once again. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve.